All right, my name is Mark Brannon. It's a pleasure to be here at the Great Plains Growers Conference with everybody. Um, my wife, Michelle, and I own a acre and a half farm up in Omaha, Nebraska. So we're an urban farm in central Omaha. Uh, pretty typical diversified vegetable farm. Uh, we have about a 30 member CSA, sell the restaurants. Uh, historically, I've done a couple of farmers markets. We got away from that in the last past couple of years. Um, and our project that I'm going to talk about today was an NCR SARE funded uh, farmer rancher grant project back in 2019. It was a year long project uh, titled Planting a Profitable, Profitable Pollinator Habitat with Native Nebraska Plants. Uh, I will note that. Many of the plants we use in the project are native to uh, the region that I assume most everybody in this room and, and listening is from. So um, should be applicable to, to most everybody here and I hope you can take something from it. Uh, before I get into the project specifically, I'll give you a little background on, on myself and the farm so you can decide whether or not you wanna trust me. Um, I like to say we're accident, we, my wife Michelle and I are accidental farmers. We have no formal training, we grew up in the city. Uh, but we, a dream was sparked in us back in 2012. We were backpacking around Central and South America, and then one of our stops was in an a organic vegetable farm in Panama. So we grew everything from, you know, carrots, tomatoes, peppers, typical anything you can grow here. We made it, made it work there. And also, as you can see there with the bananas, there was uh, mangoes, you name avocados, you name it. It was a truly wonderful experience for us. Um, and we left that coming back to the States, not knowing exactly what we wanted to do, but knowing that we wanted to grow more of our own food because we fell in love with the lifestyle. We know we wanted to have children and stay home with those kids. So blindly, uh, we lived with my aunt for a couple months until we found the acre and a half and then jumped into it. But again, we didn't really have an intention to have this be a business or even a you know, full-time business. I will say right now we both do work full-time at the farm and we're able to make it work. We just paid off our mortgage this year after seven years living there. Uh, so it's working well enough. Um, and I'm gonna share some of that story, how we got there. Um, as you can see, we have three wonderful boys that takes up the majority of our time. Farming's really the second, second job. That's why I was a little late getting here. Thanks for putting up with me. Uh, I'd like to say that it was a, as, as any farmer, diversified vegetable farmer knows, it was a very steep learning curve, uh, not having uh, had years of experience in the field. Even if after one or two years, you think you got it nailed, different weather pattern or, or different pest will come up and you, you realize you don't know as nearly as much as you knew. Uh, so it's been a learning experience to be sure. Uh, we, we, we sort of went at it uh, I, I like to say, you know, a lot of the same way a lot of people went, go at it with Gusto, reading all the books we can, all the latest uh, magazines, Mother of News, this, that, the other, bought a BCS, started doing diversified vegetables because, well, that's what we wanted to eat. Uh, as we grew, uh, first I took it on as a full time job, then Michelle moved away from her job. Uh, that's what we've done the last few years. It's been fantastic, but we realized what we wanted and what fit with our farm, uh, we don't have any employees, it's just the two of us. Uh, we wouldn't necessarily you know, become rich doing it the typical way, competing against doing the same thing that everybody else is doing, competing, offering the same vegetables. Um, and so one thing, Michelle, she, you know, she, um, she's always been great with value-added products. We began to diversify our value-added products. Um, as you can see there on our table, we've got some uh, beeswax candles. We, we keep bees. Uh, but she began to, you know, it wasn't our idea. Other people at market were doing the same, offering candles with herbs and infused, uh, not just essential oils, but infused with herbs. And uh, we, began, we began to do that. And, and we, you know, everybody else that was doing that was buying their herbs from us or from somebody similar to us. And we really found that uh, that was sort of a niche for us. Um, and in addition to that, there's uh, there, up in Omaha, or up at, north of Omaha in Blair, Nebraska, there's a wonderful uh, botanical shop, Prairie Star Botanicals. Uh, they do wonderful work, do nationwide sales. They began buying from us uh, stuff that I, when we started out, didn't even know you could grow for profit, like echinacea, uh, coneflower, uh, uh, 
Common URL, some stuff that Michelle was already using in some of our products, but we realized there was potentially more opportunity there. And that's when we uh, began to discover the, the NCR Sarah Grant. Um, it was a pretty modest grant. We, we only got $2,900. In hindsight, I wish I would ask for more. Um, but it's a wonderful grant. Anybody that has looked at it is uh, afraid to apply, you know, whether it be a, a farmer rancher grant or a partnership grant, just go for it. Um, we had a simple idea, and that was just that we could sell more native perennials. It would be good for our farm, generate more revenue, also be good for our farm environmentally, ecologically. Um, we presented that idea, and it was funded. Uh, this is the title again was planting a profitable pollinator ha native ha habitat with native Nebraska plants. Um, and this is our, our project brief was we will assess the potential for small diversified farmers to generate profit through the establishment of permanent pollinator habitat that consists of a variety of native plants that can be marketed as high value alternative crops. Uh, and we plan to show that there are a number of pollinator friendly plants in native Nebraska that can be utilized to build a stronger, healthier farm ecosystem while simultaneously, simultaneously providing an additional revenue stream. And then that, that part was important to us, uh, not just providing the additional revenue stream, um, something that we could rel rely on year after year, but you know, we, we, plan to, we plan to be at our house forever, uh, turned over our kids. If they want, to, they want to farm it, they can do that. If not, they can sell it. But we want this area to be an oasis in the city um, and, and improving the land uh, as, as the years went on farming, we realized that improving the land was needed to be a more important uh, aspect of our operation. We we're excited about the, the opportunity that native plants offered to do so. Uh, anytime you do a, a, a NCR SARE grant, you're charged with measuring the, the benefits and the impacts of the project. And uh, they, re they really want you to focus on one specific uh, benefit, uh, you know, whether it be economic sustainability, social sustainability, or envi environmental sustainability. Show that your project can make strides demonstrating that uh, not just on your farm, but potentially on other farms, can make a difference toward, uh, in one of these areas. It doesn't need to meet every area. Um, I, I am currently on the NCR SARE uh, review committee for uh, for the region, so I know that we you really only need to hit one of these. Uh, when we applied, uh, we did our, our aim was to show the obviously the economic sustainability of the project, but also the, we we really wanted to focus on the the social sustainability of the project. We really didn't even mention the environmental sustainability in our application. It obviously has clear environmental uh, implications, you know, as far as improving biodiversity and providing a place for uh, beneficial insects. But so that would have, you know, there's many ways you can focus on, um, you know, you can, you can just focus on one area and, and don't make it too complicated, I guess, when you're applying. Uh, I'll talk quickly about each one of these though. With ours, the economic sustainability was clearly just to have improved income or profitability and improved market opportunities. So as far as like, as far as profitability, I can tell you the project was a total success. Um, I can't tell you how many times in the past I'd planted an entire three by 40 foot bed of radishes. And I only got three quarters of that bed sold. Um, well, because in early April, where we're from, everybody has radishes. That's the only thing you can have at that time. Uh, you're competing against a lot of, you know, a lot of similar operations. Um, so for us, it, but ultimately square footage, uh, it did prove to be certain plants were more profitable per square foot. And I'll talk more in detail about that in a little bit. And then improved market opportunities. Obviously, um, at a farmer's market uh, or, or even going out to restaurants, whatever it may be, um, you're, there's only so many customers and, and so many, you know, more, it seems like now, nowadays there's more and more farmers. Uh, so we wanted to find untapped market opportunities in our, um, in our area. And that's, you know, with Prairie Star Botanicals really opened our eyes. Um, the botanical industry is a really fast growing industry. And there's, after connecting with them, there's lots of people that they work with that then reach out to us. Um, for, you know, for similar product. Uh, and then also, I mean, some other stuff that really opened our eyes, you know, a couple ice cream shops in town wanting uh, native herbs, anise hyssop, 
or even uh, 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 purple cone flour, putting stuff like that to make, you know, have their value added ice cream, um, you know, using our product. So uh, in that aspect, it was a, a successful project. And the social sustainability, like I said, for us, that was a big deal. Uh, the improved quality of life. Sarah outlines that, you know, if you can, if you can spend less time on the farm and more time with your family, more time doing things outside the farm that you enjoy, whether it be bowling, or like to disc golf, well, you're going to have, you're going to be a better farmer because you're going to be happier. And so um, that, that goes along with, uh, you know, make the profitability, but also I'll talk about how the maintenance of, of the native plants for us was uh, a, a big, uh, a big change of pace as far as being less maintenance and day-to-day uh, -day maintenance and turnover year to year. And then environmental sustainability, uh, I think that's pretty clear. Um, you know, offering, you know, planting native plants is, is uh, it's good for biological diversity. I really like to highlight a couple books, Building Soils for, for Better Crops with Sarah by Fred Madgoff and Harold Van Ness. It, it really talks about no matter what type of farmer, if, if you're a row crop farmer here, there are benefits to incorporating native plants in your operation. Uh, getting, getting better pollination on whatever crops, whatever your cash crops are, uh, but also pest control. Uh, you don't want to under, un, underestimate the value of pest control. Uh, many, of those, many of those native flowers are uniquely shaped for insects and, and pests that have been pests that have been around for a long time that may not have a place on our farm right now. But if we give them a place, their numbers increase, and then they can be a form of pest control on your farm. Uh, and then also uh, decrease water use. As far as economic sustainability, uh, you know, I've got a, a chart here comparing native perennials versus the typical annual, annual vegetables, at least in our experience. Uh, there's very little competition, at least where we're from, as far as marketing these crops. Um, the flowers and herbs and, and roots that we, we grow. And I've got, you may be wondering exactly what, what, what plants I'm talking about. Common yarrow, purple cone flower, lead plant, Solomon seal, blue vervain, any, a lot of plant, pretty, pretty much any plants you find on the, on the plains here um, in the natural prairies. Um, but again, getting back to, to the difference between the typical annual vegetables, are, and, and, and we still, we haven't gotten away from that. We still, obviously, we're not going to sustain our entire farm um, through the marketing of, of, these, of these native plants, but it has provided a nice additional revenue stream, like I said, one that uh, with less work and, and, and frankly is more satisfying. Uh, so again, there's, there's not that many people growing this type of stuff where we're from. I think you might find the same thing around here or anywhere, where, wherever you're from. Um, whereas, you know, typical annual vegetables, it's a race to the bottom. So, you know, I have to charge $1.50 at market for my radishes per bunch. Why? Well, because there's 30 other people charging the exact same thing. If I charge $2, they're not going to get bought, even though it costs me $2.25 or $2.35 or who knows how much to produce them. Um, so again, going along with that, you, you become a price setter versus a price taker. If you're the only one who has that individual product, um, and you'll find that there generally is, is there, there's people willing to pay. Um, for us, the, the, uh, you know, uh, this was a big thing. Is it's a one-time investment versus yearly expenditures. Um, and you, you can do it a lot cheaper than we did. We, we set it up in a 2,000 square foot perennial garden and we set it up to, to be able to compare the production of, of the perennials versus the, the annuals. We set up in the same sort of scheme that we do our annual vegetables, which is raised beds about a little over 36 inches wide with heavy mulch in the, uh, heavy mulch in the aisles. Um, and then we bought plants, established plants, you know, four inch or quart pots uh, from, some, from a variety of uh, native plant suppliers in our region. And that was because of the time constraints of the project. We, we wanted to get in and be able to have it, have it established to the point where we could then start selling the product. Whereas, but, but there is a much cheaper alternative. Uh, and, you know, and that would be seeding. You know, 
if you have the patients seeding perennial plant per, perennial natives in the in the fall is a fantastic cheaper way to do it um you know you're you're gonna wait if you're if you're looking to market it you, you know you're gonna wait another year at least another year and a half before you before you you see the fruits of that labor but you know there's if you're gonna look if you're gonna if you're looking to get strips or uh you know anything in a larger scale i'd say that would be the way to go but again it's just it's a one-time expense and, and versus you know looking through those seed catalogs every year and then you know with the native perennials there, there are multiple marketing channels you know you can sell them fresh you can sell them dried you put them in use them in value-added products of course that's the same thing in, in typical annual vegetables we do a lot of uh dried peppers and and the like so um not quite much of a difference there but as far as social sustainability i think that's that that's what we found was the biggest difference um with the native perennials we, we had that one-time installation um and then you know we've laid mulch one 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 step one one time since then in the aisles but it's just a tremendous difference between the amount of uh you know weekly maintenance that these this area this same 2000 square foot takes compared to 2000 square foot that we have you know whether it be in tomatoes or or, or whatever what have you um obviously for us being a small farm we want to get at least two cycles of a crop you know per year in, in any given bed usually three um and so we're constantly prepping those beds getting compost on those beds um you know shaping them seeding them and then you know if you're seeding the, the competition with weeds when you're seeding is 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 the bane of my existence and has been that's part of the reason why this project appealed to me of course the goal is every year you you're you're competing less and less with weeds but it seems like it's a it's a losing battle sometimes and so that one-time installation uh really appealed to us and then the middle minimal, minimal maintenance uh versus the endless upkeep uh not only not only the weeding but the watering uh is was a big deal uh and then as far as if you want to talk about taking care of the beds versus you know all the way to harvesting post-harvest storage um it's generally easy on the back clipping flowers clipping seed heads digging up roots so a lot of the, the the plants that we grow are for the roots uh the botan botanical industry uses the, the roots don't don't ask me to explain it i'm mean, gonna just grow it um in tinctures and whatnot but it's really it, it's um it's a lot easier on the back versus you know hauling 60 pounds of cucumbers from from our back 40 you know every two days and then a, one thing we were surprised about we didn't we didn't uh expect going in was was the beauty that it provides all four seasons you know we knew it would provide beneficial habitat uh but you know the, the beds that we had our tomatoes in right now you know this year they're mulch right now with with, with leaf and straw mulch so they don't look ugly they're not beautiful and they're not inspiring you go out in the perennial garden right now and it is those seed those seed heads are still there the birds are fluttering around it's still an active farm all four seasons um so much so that, i mean we enjoyed the space we carved out another area um next to the perennial garden and then expanded the perennial garden and in that uh, area in between we built a uh flag flagstone patio you know spent a good deal of money to invest more in that space because we found that you know we host with our csa members and we you know again we got away from farmers markets so a big thing for us was we had people pick up uh vegetables weekly on the farm neighbors and and, and when that would come um we'd have our pickup date and a lot of them especially during the pandemic we found like to meander around the farm and get outside away from, you know away from everybody obviously but uh you know enjoy a beautiful space and that that was clearly obvious that that became the favorite of, of everybody who visited the farm so uh in a focal point so we built around that and we you know and that was just this fall so we hope to host events there in the future possibly another revenue uh generated opportunity uh environmental sustainability like i said minimal water use uh that that was 
that was really a tremendous surprise. I mean, I, I guess I should have seen it coming, but like with our annual vegetables, we typically, you know, whether it be on drip or sprinkler, we got both systems going. It's about an inch a week. Uh, some crops is a lot less or a little bit less. Some crops is a little bit more, especially last couple summers in Omaha. Uh, it's been dry and hot and dry and dry. Um, and so I call it hauling hoses. You know, the kid, the kids say, you going to go haul hose, dad? And I say, yeah, you know, moving, moving it from one hose, one, one drip system to the, to the other. Um, and that's, that becomes an expense over time, obviously. Um, but with the native perennials, we had a drip system when we first, uh, installed it, we installed the drip system, uh, and we, 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 we used it about on average, you know, about what we normally would, how we would normally use it on other crops, um, for that first season. But again, found out we really didn't need that. And we took that drip system out. And ever since then, we have not watered that one time. So, I mean, they're, they're native to this region you know, region for a reason, they survive, you know, years of drought, years of too much water, this, that, the other. Um, but it's been, that's been a really great reprieve, not having to water, so kind of the time, but also the cost. Um, zero soil disturbance. That's when, you know, building, building soils for better crops, you know, less soil disturbance you have, the more the microbiome, you know, can improve, um, and, and again, with these perennial crops, we planted them, the beds are uh, established and we, have, we don't do anything with them. Uh, some of them I do mow over, it depends on the, on the, on the crop, uh, the, like the yarrow I'll mow over. Uh, but for the most part, uh, I mean, again, the soil is not being disturbed, it, it, uh, but with typical annual vegetables, you know, you're, you're generally one way or another, you're, you're disturbing the soil. Um, and so I find that, you know, just by anecdotal evidence, the soil is, after a few years, the soil is better in that area than in the, in the other more intensely farmed areas of our farm. Uh, and then, you know, environmentally it provides year-round habitat for beneficial insects, birds, mammals, and more. Um, you might think, well, what else could be there? But there was a tortoise, tortoise that was burrowing in and, and making a nest, uh, burying some eggs recently. So that was a surprise. But, uh, you know, with the typical annual vegetables, if you do want to provide year-round habitat or year-round cover, you know, you're, you're, having to, you're having to use cover crops, which is, that's, you know, that's what we do in our other beds. Uh, it's a great practice. But again, that, that adds just one more step in the process of planting the cover crop, of ultimately terminate two, two more steps, terminating the cover crop, uh, and then additional cost. So you might be wondering how, you know, how do we market some of those native plants? Um, cut flower arrangements is a big one, something, uh, for us, we, again, we don't do the market so much anymore, but we were really surprised how successful the cut flower, uh, the native flowers did at market. Um, you know, they're less ubiquitous than, than the zinnias that everybody has and that we have too, to fill out, fill, fill, fill out our arrangements. But, um, you know, you get some unique flowers that people have never seen they haven't seen since they used to live on their grandma's, or, you know, they used to visit their grandmother's farm. It really brings them to the table. They buy the flowers and they, they buy our radishes instead of somebody else's radishes. Um, and florists too, uh, you know, they, they have their typical sheets that they get from people that, you know, the Im imported flowers that they get, and it's not gonna vary. They can distinguish themselves um, with your flowers. And that's something to, to highlight to them. Uh, yeah, they, they're a little, some, a lot of them are doubtful at first or, or not sure that the flowers are gonna hold up. You might have to give them uh, some stems for free, but a lot of the native flowers do really hold up well. Uh, and so that, you know, if you get it in their hands, I think you'll find that, that they'll love it. And then medicinal herbs, I, you know, like I said, there's a surging demand for the botanical products. Just a few years ago is that one uh, botanical shop in Blair, Nebraska that was buying from us. And now there's uh, three or four in Omaha and, and another in Lincoln. So it's a growing industry uh, and really an industry that's willing to pay top dollar for product. And then value added products. We do a lot of that, um, you know, both at the markets, but also online. For us, it's been great to, uh, you know, have a diverse uh, revenue stream, but, you know, not, not, you know, spread that revenue out over you know, throughout the winter. Um, Michelle does a lot of body products. She's a, 
pasty redhead that has always had skin problems and she found that there was nothing that could ever do it uh you know treat her skin right and so she years ago she you know before we even had her far she began making her own products and, and so she uses a lot of these products in the lip balm and salves and soaps that we sell at market and again there's there's a few other soap sellers and, and you know four or five other people that do salves or something similar but we distinguish ourselves in the fact that we take the product from the beginning and bring it all the way into the end product um great for potpourri i mean you know Anise test up, yarrow, lead plant. I mean, any 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 native flower is gonna gonna have some smell to it. Um, so just throw it in that potpourri, and if it doesn't have much of smell, that's fine. It's gonna bulk up the product. Um, but again, like I said, it has it has year round year round revenue for us, so that's good. Uh, less pressure to to get all of our revenue in the summer months, although it's. The growing season is getting longer up in Omaha. We're, we're basically down to almost down to four. We were in 5B when I started, or 5A, 5B. We're, we're, by the time I'm done, we'll be in, I don't know, Oklahoma City or Kansas City, whenever you guys are in 4B. Or excuse me, going the wrong way, getting colder. Uh, marketing channels, again, here's just an example of, you know, some of the cut flowers that we do. That's that white is common yarrow. Uh, that's the native plant. There's also Colorado yarrow, which is that pink pink flower, uh, but that also comes in pink, purple, yellow. Uh, and yarrow is fantastic. It has has one of the longest shelf lives of any flower. Um, you know, it'll last. Well, it'll last, I mean, it'll last fresh as long as any the, any, of, any other flower in the bouquet will last fresh. And then when the rest of the bouquet is done, you can stick the yarrow up in your you know wherever you'd like. And it keeps its color, keeps its shape for years and years and years. I mean, years. We have some yellow, yeah. Um, and it's a great, it has, uh, it's a really good shape to fill out the bouquets. If, if you're, you know, if, if you may make bouquets, you know that uh, that's important to have a product like that. Um, also, it's an early bloomer and it blooms all throughout the year. And most, most flowers that we work with, the native flowers, they, they do that, right? Because that's, that's, that's what they want to do. You, you cut off their flower and their seeds, they're going to send out more seeds trying to, trying to continue their gene pool and, and get that into the ground. So they'll provide for you in a much longer window, I found, than most of the other flowers that we grow for, for bouquets. Um, the, the green one on the, on, the, uh, on the edge there, that that's Solomon Seal, which we never, we never, it's Solomon Seal, we never considered for cut flowers. We were growing that specifically for prairie started for the roots for them to use. Um, but uh, it's, a, it's a plant that grows in, in a, a real, it prefers a shady location. Uh, you'll find it in a lot of the, like the oak forest uh, around Omaha and, and um, you know, throughout Missouri. And it, it has these tiny little bell flowers, um, which are beautiful, but really it's just, it's, a, it's great foliage for, for bouquets. Um, and then there's just a few pictures of, uh, you know, our, our potpourri and uh, not everything in there is, is entirely native. We mix it with a variety of other uh, nice smelling herbs that we grow. But we did, we did create a new, a new line of products called Nebraska Wildflower, our Nebraska Wildflower series. And so we had a Nebraska Wildflower soap and Nebraska Wildflower candles. Um, just over time, we found there are some people who do not like essential oils, whether it be in their soap or their candles, want it more, uh, more pure. Um, and so we, you know, we found that there was a, there was a market for that and began uh, creating these essential oil, essential oil free products, uh, specifically from wild bergamot and coneflower. And, uh, you know, that's, again, that's, this is the, only, we're the only ones on earth offering that product. I know that. And it's been a, you know, it's been a good seller. So I encourage you to try and you know whether or not you're going to incorporate native plants on your farm whatever it may be try to find your own niche uh something that sets you apart um some of the native print again we tried over we tried 12 different varieties and then again we've we've uh we've expanded our perennial garden and um tried others since the since the project for us the ones that work best for cut flowers are common yarrow again for that filling um, that ability to fill out and also the, the, the shelf life. 
purple cone flower. Um, it doesn't last as long as far as vase life goes, but that's one that everybody uh, recognizes, you know, and, and it's just, it's striking throughout the season. And, and, and no one, no one is, no one is uh, identical. You know, you'll, the, that's one, one thing I love about purple cone flowers. The sizes of the, of the seed heads vary, the shapes of them do, the petals. Um, and so they're, they're popular at market. Lead plant, uh, again, another one that we were growing for the root, uh, but we found that, and that's more of a, more of a shrub. I have a picture of that, sorry for that, but it's more of a, a low growing shrub, again, that grows well in shaded areas. Solomon seal is that arching plant. Uh, and there's, uh, with a lot of these, there's, there's a whole bunch, you know, there's a whole variety of Solomon seal plants. Uh, some that might be better suited for Missouri, some, some that might be better suited for uh, uh, more, uh, you know, a drier habitat versus a wet habitat. So, um, you know, the possibilities are endless. Uh, my favorite plant that we grow there, you can see up on top is the pur this purple one here. Um, it's, that's hoary vervain. Uh, but any plant in the vervain family is just fantastic. Uh, you might find the one drawback is it's almost like it is a weed. Uh, you know, if you, if you, we we found it 20, 30 feet away from the beds that we have it, where, where, where plants are popping up, who knows exactly how they got there, but um, it's sort of a, it's not woody, it can become woody later in the season, I suppose, but it, uh, it sends up these tall flat, these tall spikes, and again, it, like most of the others, you cut it, and it, it just sends out more, and more, and more, and more, and it's just a tremendous accent to any bouquet, you know, it's, it stands up, you know, in, you know, several inches above any other flower. Um, and again, it has, has a tremendous shelf life, uh, base life, excuse me. Um, so any of the verbanes, and they thrive, again, they, they thrive in dry conditions. So in poor conditions, poor soil. Um, when we try to, um, you know, when we set up our printer garden, uh, not everything, Grew well, you know, some of them were frankly, some of, some of it was a loss. Uh, you know, we have a couple milkweeds that, you know, never, never really flourished. And economically, it made no sense to, you, you know, we thought they might be good in cut flowers, but it just didn't work. Um, so this is why I'm going to highlight, highlight, highlight these that did. Spiderwort, uh, we had Ohio spiderwort. For us, spiderwort was fantastic because of the, uh, the blooming window. It's the earliest flower to bloom on our farm. Um, and so, uh, you know, along with ch like chai flowers and some other stuff really early in the season. Um, so it allows you to, we, we were able, you know, building around the big patch of spider where we were able to, you know, we were able to, to market a good month, month and a half earlier as far as cut flowers go than we normally would have. You know, any loop, lupine variety is going to be great. And then there's just, just a whole wide variety of woody ornamentals that especially I think are popular with, with forest. Medicinally, um, you know, one thing I'd like to say is that you, you'll notice that the plants that we market as medicinal herbs, a good number of them were also on that last list as far as flower bouquets. So that's the great thing about it is there's two, you know, with, with any given product, there's plenty of marketing channels um, and avenues that you can go down. Common Yara, like I said, was a fantastic cut flower, but that's, we sell, that's probably our, by weight, that's probably what we sell most of. Um, and, and you utilize most of it. Again, it, um, it's an early bloomer, comes again. We use it in all our potpourris, candle, the, the Nebraska wildflower series. Um, but again, the, the botanical industry, um, they use it in tea, uh, uh, just straight, straight up yarrow tea, but also then, you know, tinctures and, and the like. Purple cone flowers, same, kind of the same story. Uh, lead plant is is used for for you know again you can harvest the roots and you know you want to do it. Last year was the first year we did it after you know after two years we didn't we didn't want to over harvest it or, or do any um, damage to the plants. So uh, Solomon seal though again it was great for cut flower but we harvest that for the roots as well. Wild bergamot is fantastic for teas. Uh, you know any other any other thing that you're going to use yarrow for as well. Uh, mullein root, 
is, is one that thrives in kind of wet conditions. Elderberry and elderflower, that wasn't one that was part of our project, but we, that was one that when we, when we expanded, we incorporated um, you know, a patch of, of elderberries. We'd already been selling. You know, we had a friend that had a, had, a, had a big patch, and so we would always go there and harvest. And so we already had a market for them, uh, but they established themselves incredibly quickly. You know, within probably a year, if not, you know, a year and a half, you can start harvesting, whether it be the flowers or the berries. We, you know, we sell the flowers in the spring when they're in bloom to, you know, to Prairie Star, also to the ice cream shops. Um, also, quite a few restaurants will enjoy making their own, um, you know, like fancy cocktails, uh, old fashioned cocktails. And that's one, that's one both elderflower and elderberry that they love to utilize. It's a lot of old fashioned recipes. That's um, you'll always see them driving down Iowa or Nebraska those in the spring. What are those big, big white flowers that grow along the train tracks in the ditches? That's them. They love the, they love the ditches and that wet, those wet feet. Anise hyssop is just a workhorse for us. Um, you know, it, uh, you know, use it in potpourri, a lot, in a lot of the, uh, the candles and soaps. It is just, is one of the most fantastic smelling plants you'll come across. Any of the, anything in the, in the hyssop family, I suppose, but um it, the anise hyssop does well for us one that wasn't in our project but we you know we came across um you know we'd always had a little jerusalem artichoke patch but uh we really expanded production of that when we uh were trying to get away from annual vegetables and that was one of the best things we ever did uh was put a lot of space into that uh it's a native to, to pretty much all of north america and you know it, it it grows up tremendous amount of of biomass if you're looking to grow something for biomass um, you know, we have a, like a chipper that end of the season after we harvest the roots, just got thousands of pounds of stalks and leaves and, and flowers, you know, that's great. You know, put that back into the soil. Livestock. Exactly. Livestock. You know, it's a, tr uh, I've got a friend that uses it for his pigs. Right. And it's, it's, it's tremendously healthy for him. Great for him. And just no matter what you think, oh boy, they ravaged the patch and it's gone. It'll come back year after year after year. That's, I mean, don't get scared. It says that it spreads like crazy, but if you're truly harvesting it for, like we do, um, you know, you harvest it and then it comes back about the same strength from the year before. Um, yeah, and it's it's like magic. And we get, to know, like what we're selling it for, who we're selling it to, we get six to eight dollars a pound, with yields up to two dollars a square foot. Now, I'll tell you, I don't know, I don't care, know how much you sell your radishes for, but we will never get that with our radishes. And again, this. The Jerusalem artichoke, we don't, we do not water. It's in the farthest stretch of our property, sort of as a, as a fence line almost. Uh, we've got a car dealership right next to our uh, property, so it, it, it helps block the uh, F-150s. Uh, but, you know, we, again, we don't water it. I don't think about it until it comes time to harvesting it, and then we can't, you know, this is, this is just one of the loads recently that we were taking to, to a restaurant. They, 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 uh, you know, they buy as much as you can produce, at least around, around Omaha they do. And then, I mean, again, maybe not everyone's going to be interested in, this, interested in this, but then once we were selling to some of these uh, botanical places, they started asking us for certain things we never heard of or certain things that we thought had no value, right? Like dandelion root. I mean, every year we, I, I never really cared about dandelions. We never tried to get them out. They're just there. Um, but we have plenty of them. And so that prairie star, buy, you know, buys as many as we can get them in the fall. They, they want it, you know, they don't want it until it gets cold and there's some chemical uh, transition in, in the properties of the roots. But, you know, when I'm done, basically done with almost everything else in the farm, I just go out with my hori hori and dig as many dandelions as I can for 18 a pound. Stinging nettles, you know, the same thing. Like we were trying to, there's just this one little patch on our property and we were trying to battle it back year after year. And then found out there were people that wanted it. Um, and so we just let that patch be and then make a little money off of it. Uh, wild raspberry leaf, using tea. We use in some of our teas, but also uh, sell to a couple different companies. And, uh, and then black willow wood, you know, they, uh, they use it, the apothecary, but also we, you know, we, we make our own home, homemade root stimulant as, at, out of it. And again, anecdotally, it works, it works just as well as the stuff we buy. Um, you know, if anybody isn't interested in, in incorporating native plants uh, on their farm, you know, whether it be for revenue, but like I said, it doesn't have to be for that. Uh, there, there's social benefits, there's environmental benefits. 
but also, you, you know, again, your, your cash crop may benefit from uh, native plants on your farm. Um, some air, some um, great businesses in our area, most of them I've worked with. Prairie Legacy is uh, in, in Western Nebraska, not way out in Western Nebraska, but the town of Western Nebraska um, is by far, I think, uh, the, the best. Uh, she's, she's got a tremendous operation there. Um, it's a little, it's kind of far out, but it's worth it if, you, if you're in the area. And then uh, Missouri Wildflowers Nursery in Jeff, Jeff City, Missouri. Uh, the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum in Lincoln has an annual plant sale. So if you're from Nebraska, check them out in the spring. Uh, City Roots Nursery is not one that I've been to. I used to live in Kansas City. That's where I went to college. Um, but as I was searching for more, um, you know, places that offer these, these type of products, you know, these type of plants and seeds, you know, for, for potential farmers that might be here listening, uh, it seemed like they have a great thing going down there in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, Prairie Moon Nurseries, uh, I've never bought anything from them, but their, their website's fantastic. If you want to learn more about um, growing conditions and the like, um, I found them to be a great resource. And then Midwest Native Nursery is, is in Lincoln, Nebraska as well. They, uh, you know, have been around just a couple of years, but I think they're doing really good things. And, and uh, if you're from Lincoln, I'm sure it'd be, or Nebraska or Iowa, it'd be great to support them. Um, I don't know where I'm at with time, over or under, but that's, that's about what I had. 